Okay. So I need to this is where what you're coming for. And um, we should do this. <laughs> It's a bit well behind. Yeah, man. Yeah. But I think we can. Where are you done, man? <laughs> Come on, that. It would be nice if there are some, some fire, like, crack like this, um, like this yeah. size. Uh, Christmas. We actually did, did something like this at home for Christmas. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it felt very warm. Plasma <laughs> 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 TV. My favorite. So uh, I'm very uh, honored to to do this uh, event and especially inviting uh, Michael for uh, for this event uh, for the first time uh, of the year in the Agile community. And uh, all the while I've been organizing events since 2010. That's like 10 years ago, a decade ago, you can say. And uh, all the while it is you know, when we talk about or uh, see the word Agile software development. It's very easy to get a lot of uh, audience or people that want to talk about process and people and framework. Uh, and uh, that's the tendency. And that's the tendency that we see from the agile communities around. So I think there isn't enough focus on actually developing software, developing practices. And um, so I just have this idea about, oh, let's talk about software cross issue because this relates to part of the agile development as well. And that's where it comes, it's good for like, people like Ken Beck, Martin Fowler, uh, Uncle Bob Martin, um, like 20 years ago. So uh, then I thought, you know, who would be a suitable person, person to, to have this talk, uh, fireside chat? And, and I think, is it a fortunate or I think I'm lucky that in the last uh, half a year or more than half a year, uh, Michael has also invited me to his um, meetup, uh, Junior Lab uh, meetup, uh, where I also we co host uh, coding dojos and also uh, agile review sessions. And that's when I learned more about him. I've known him for, I think, since few years ago, but we only chat in the message. And then, uh, most recently, he, he now worked in GovTech and uh, at a place where I also. Uh, Engaged. So we have some more opportunities, working opportunities together. Uh, from what I uh, understand about him, his values and principles and so on, I think he is a, um, a fit that I see from the related books on materials or literature that the cross -net, software cross-membership movement started 20 years ago or around that. So therefore, I thought uh, like I'm him and he says, uh, yes, he can make it, yeah, okay. This makes a fantastic start of the year, which also means that I would, from this on, um, I would try to cover at least 50% of the events to be related to developer related, developer practices related, uh, that is more connected than just about uh, frameworks or processes or people. So, uh, Michael is famous in Singapore and probably in the, in the region, I'm not sure. Thank you. Yeah. So, I used to tell people, uh, like, anyone knows Uncle Bob Martin? Uncle Bob Martin? Uncle Bob. Robert Martin. Robert Martin, yeah, he wrote, he, he wrote the, the book, uh, Clean Code, that is the one of the books that, that, that is very popular. Um, so I, I kind of, uh, when I tell people about uh, Michael, Michael Chain, Chain uh, I would say that he's like, he's as popular as Uncle Bob in the US. Actually, Uncle Bob is uh, even popular in the, you know, the whole world, actually. Uh, probably not here. <laughs> so, but, uh, but uh, he is more, uh, Michael Chain is uh, sober than Uncle Bob. And uh, he, if you see Uncle Bob's talks, it's like, blah. blah. But, but he, he, he did have uh, interesting materials from that. So, um, so um, Michael has been software developer for a long time in Singapore. He is so deeply, deeply rooted in the communities, development communities like PHP, Music Group, um, 
He co founded the iOS uh, Scouts uh, iOS user group in Singapore. Uh, he organized a PhD conference. Uh, he know many of the uh, community, development community leaders in Singapore as well. So uh, it is not, I think, you are one of a kind that uh, I think in this decade or this era that is hard to find. So, so I'm glad that uh, my man, I got it. Thanks. So, uh, how, how we work in this side chat? Um, uh, I, I don't know format, it's just questions. I have a series of questions. Over here. And, and you know, any, any time, at any time you have some questions for him, just raise up a hand, we will pass my over to you. And then we will have conversations for that. <laughs> and um, at some point in time, I may also try to balance. Uh, maybe you have too much questions from the round, I may balance too. Oh, maybe let's uh, finish up some of the questions so that we can end on time. We try to end around 8, 8, 8 10 ish. Yeah. So uh, maybe uh, as a starter, uh, could you introduce uh, us, um, give us a bit better of your development experience? Sure. I started out as a uh, website designer back in 2001, probably in 1999, uh, that was probably around the time I was uh, in university. So I did, uh, did some, uh, so basically during my uh, national service, I actually did some uh, computer work uh, in doing my essays. And I actually got to build like an intranet website for the, for the division I was, I was at in uh, doing my national service. Um, so from there, like, wow, I got this uh, liking for building websites. Um, so during my university days, I basically joined a web design company part time as a web designer. As I was doing this, I was uh, I was actually building stuff. Um, uh, basically, there were three developers uh, who were there, and they were doing coding in, in ColdFusion, uh, which is a programming soft a programming language that I think some of you may be familiar with. Um, so, so, they, so the three ladies there built a web, uh, e-commerce website and I was responsible for beautifying their code, right? So because I was uh, applying the CSS, font tags, and tables, and ta table layouts and stuff. But as I did this, I also looked at the code and I said, wow, this, this code fusion shit is quite cool. I can like, you know, connect the database, I can do like all sorts of things. So a part of me became very curious. I mean, I'm always naturally curious. And from that curiosity, I just started asking, you know, what does this code do? What does this, this app code do? What does this thing do? Um, from that, I uh, got a bit, know a little bit more about coding, uh, how it's done. Um, for your information, I don't have a, I don't have a com science degree, so I majored in this stream for legal science in NUS. And from there, um, so basically from there, uh, from the three, three ladies who were working on the code, uh, I copied and pasted a lot of things. It, it was, so uh, I had this opportunity to help an NGO build their yeah, uh, Web Z thing. So I thought, like, hey, I could come and do this. I could do this. I figured it out. So, like, a lot of things that I do, I like to jump in the end of the pool. I thought, like, you know, this, like, I like to challenge technology. I like to think technology can do this. I've seen Yahoo. Yahoo can do this and Google. I can key in something, do a platform field, and things to happen. I could do a login, I could I could do a login system, and all that stuff. I could easily do it. Um, I've seen it done. But I need to figure out how to do it. So basically, about pop, looking at how people write the code and copy pasting and did something. So I did a pro bono website, the first one where we were user login, and it was basically back in the day before they were bloggers, uh, where they were blogger or blogspot and all that thing. So I built a, a little website for them, and from there I was like, wow, I'm really addicted. I got addicted to writing code and building stuff. So part of me is I, I'm, just, I'm, I'm again I'm curious, I'm naturally curious person. I like to see how things work. And that kind of led me along the way to doing uh, more other things in, in, uh, and to where I am now. So, so after that, uh, where did you go? So as I was working part time in the design firm, uh, I was basically uh, um, and company got a client, and the client could uh, had only Linux servers. So if you are familiar with ColdFusion, back in two thousand one um, and two thousand one, they only had support for Windows servers. So we had first a client which doesn't have a Windows server and they only have a Linux server. So I looked at the, the, what was available in the server. Oh, I could, what type of coding languages, programming languages could I use? There was SHTML, which is like a server side. It's a basically CGI, but using HTML as an interface. And there's PHP. I was like, huh, 
that's HTML, that's CGI, that's all this way out. PHP, that's a new, that's a new hotness. Let's try that. So, uh, so I built, uh, started uh, looking at how to build a website using PHP. I was so new back then that I didn't even know how to uh, upload a file. Right, there was no documentation on how to upload the uh, image file to the website. So what I did was I just FTP the file in, <laughs> got the path, copy paste into the home view, and save. <laughs> so it was also my first time working with database, uh, web-based database, uh, which is not SQL server, which is by the time it was MySQL. So from that experience, wow, I really like uh, building web applications. I knew the first time in my, in my life I realized I could do things not just in one language, but I could do things in multiple languages. It's kind of fun. Um, yeah, so I started doing more PHP. Even after I finished school, I kept doing PHP stuff. I uh, started my own design, uh, web design company, building uh, websites for other people. Um, and it got to a point where I got lots of clients, but they were all paying in friendship price. So, <laughs> which essentially I wasn't making money. Uh, but one of my, fortunately, one of my clients actually decided to buy my company over. I joined them as a CTO uh, for about two years, and I, again, through that process, I also got burnt out, and I left the industry for a while, and, but around the time when I was uh, working at that um, uh, digital agency that bought my company, I, would, I actually got interested in the concept of user groups. Uh, so I started thinking about, maybe we should do a support group for PhD developers, because I was a PhD developer back then. And I wanted a support group for all developers who are like-minded to meet each other and help get to know each other better and even share ideas about how, this, how uh, things come together. I think it's a, it's a conf conflation of two of, of my interests, two of the things that were important in my life. Uh, one thing was open source because I used open source software. At the time, I was, uh, I was a evangelical Christian, so I really, I really believe in having like support groups, like cell groups and stuff like that. So I, I want to bring the concept uh, into into my professional life, and that's, that's why I brought, uh, decided to create like, a user group, uh, the PhD, Singapore PhD user group. This was in 2008. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it turns out the uh, first meetup we I ever had was at Brewworks, and I went to create a meetup.com event, and like, yes, there's going to be lots of people signing up, and then the first meeting, like four or five people there drinking beer. We were fun. At least we got to know that there's, there were people who were interested in this, but it was, it was a very slow start. Um, but around that time, 2008, 2009, uh, Facebook uh, became quite popular, and they, they, that's when they kind of launched their first Facebook Graph, graph API. Uh, and they knew that all oh, well, people were building stuff in, for, for the uh, Facebook API, the games and whatnot. And then uh, I really wanted to uh, let people know that the PHP user group exists. So at the time, the, there was E27 was running a, a, a face, the Facebook developer garage. Basically, they kind of like decided to do a uh, little com conference where we would talk about how to use the uh, Facebook graph, graph API to do stuff. And I was there, kind of like, hey, you know, I'm, 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 I run this PHP user group, and yeah, here's my name card, take it. And then, uh, turns out a lot of people were really interested in doing this. Uh, in, in, in a, having a group and they started signing up on the Facebook group. Uh, I, I created an event. Um, turns out I have like 50 hours people signing up for that. I was like, oh shit, I have a group problem. I don't have a venue. <laughs> I don't have a, I created an event without thinking about, huh, you know, what's the harm in it? Anyway, we just create this first, you know, see what sticks and see who, who whether people will come. Turns out a lot of people interested and uh, okay, now I have a group problem, I need a venue. And I needed, uh, needed speakers. So getting speakers was pretty easy. I had to speak. I uh, got two of my friends to speak. Um, looking for a venue was also quite, uh, quite uh, wasn't that hard. Because at the time, there were already user groups around in Singapore, like the Ruby, uh, Ruby Brigade was already around, and they were actually using SMU for the, the, like their, uh, for the meetup. So I kind of called my friend from uh, Ruby Brigade and said, hey, do you have contact to a teacher or a student or something where I can get a free venue for that? Turns out that, uh, one of the teachers got in contact with me and said, yeah, I can get you in touch with a student group. They are the open, you know, they are the Object Oriented Programming Society in, in SMU. Right. Said, okay, we can let you have the room and they, they will be there and all that stuff. So yeah, so that's how I got the first meet up. Uh, going, there were people like, in, the, in the seminar room, and there were people sitting on the floor. It was all flowing, so it was quite interesting uh, for me to 
This is in 2009, probably. Yeah. So fast forward today, uh, now we are currently in uh, uh, SPX, so more published though, mm -hmm. and now we are in Plantech. Could you um, describe a bit more about what you do in Plantech? So in Plantech right now, I'm a tech lead. I'm basically leading one of the teams building uh, e-services for the government, specifically for the Ministry of Manpower. So we are building a, we're maintaining and uh, updating a work pass system that is used uh, for, for you to apply for foreign domestic workers. So if you, are, you have a helper at home that comes from uh, Philippines or Indonesia, you can use our website for you. Yeah. Uh, could you share with us what you, what you think um, software craftsmanship is? Software craftsmanship? Um, I, would, I, would like, I would like this to a painting. Right. So you you have this kind of landscape, you pass it to two different painters, um, and both of them will have a different interpretation of the landscape, right? You draw it differently, the brush strokes will be different, uh, and the colours they use, the vibrancy, and all that stuff. But some may, be, may go abstract, some may go modern, some may go whatever. So and just because that's how you, you like you can draw a landscape and you just use that creativity to do this. I think in software development is pretty much it's kind of close to that because you write the same problem and pass it to two different developers and you, will, you both have different approaches to the problem some may optimize for a particular thing then one may optimize for I.O. one may optimize for memory usage one may optimize for whatever so um, a lot of it is about it's a creative process so I feel that it's a lot of it is about your, your ability to build quality software and that's, and that's important for any company who uses uh, uh, software. Uh, what, what are some of the minimum technical practices that you think uh, a developer should know? Um, writing tests, I think, is a very important aspect of, <laughs> of, of any software developer. Because there are a lot of things that, as a software developer, we find very menial, like, like checking that my code works. I mean, that's just, that's like, you can either say, I, I never write buggy code, or you, you, and then in the back of your mind, you're still thinking, oh shit, did I actually introduce the bug there? Or you have another piece of code that actually checks that your code is working. Um, that, that gives you a peace of mind, right? Like, and, you, and you know that my software still behaves the way it does, even though I've added new things on top of it, and so on and so forth. I mean, that's, and then we have days about ease and, ease and peace of mind. Um, when you write code, then you know that we did it in a way that is it's not broken anything else, right? Could you share uh, where uh, where you uh, learn that skill or come across that test in your career? So the first time I actually got okay, so um, I first got exposed to the concept of writing tests uh, when I was working in a startup. Um, so in the startup team I was in, uh, we had a lot of very strong engineers, but we had never worked as a team before. So we were like step on each other's toes, get uh, get get much conflicts, and uh, uh, we yeah basically things couldn't work properly. Like I was working on the back end code, there was another team working on front end code, and we were like yeah things were wasn't working that well. Um, and then what happened was our CEO was advised by his investors, hey, we should just get a consultant in to kind of like teach us all the best practices and shit. Um, fortunately for us, they got they called in crypto apps to who basically came uh, so there was a season in 2011, 20, uh, 2010, 2010, 2011. So when uh, so they brought in crypto apps and they basically because crypto apps uh, they are very strong in terms of uh, pair programming, uh, all the, and all the software engineering practices, like software programming, test driven development, CI, CD, and all these other things that they, they do very well in house. They basically taught us how to do that. Um, I learned a lot from them, from like how, how we should do pair programming, say with, some, say with another engineer, to discuss about code, right? And do it in a way that is, that is very productive. And also writing code, writing tests as a way of like making sure you're, 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 you have not introduced any bugs in this. Um, so there was one time I was asking the uh, Carl, uh, Carl Pereira Martin, who I was pairing with, and hey, um, we're doing a lot of these mocks and subs and stuff, and, and you know, we've been writing tests, writing mocks, writing subs, and all that stuff. 
you know, um, what else is there? Is there, is there something more, any, more things that I need to learn to, to write tests and uh, to, to do this testing thing? And he came to me and told me, yeah, he kind of sh rubbed his chin a little bit and said, yeah, you reached the point where you're writing mocks and stuff, you're pretty much there. You're pretty much there, <laughs> right? As in, yeah, the very high level sub test, uh, level of testing. So, yes. Uh, I love us in the advanced level. Yeah, advanced level, yes. <laughs> um, so, at this point in time, if you have any questions, uh, please uh, feel free to raise your hands. Um, and another kind of question what uh, collaboration schemes that you think uh, that we should have? I guess, first of all, you need to be open. Mm -hmm. yeah? um, as you collaborate with somebody, um, yeah, you want to speak your mind, but at the same time, you also need to be open to receiving uh, other types of opinions. Um, and that is crucial in communication. That you can say as much as you want, but if you don't listen, you don't benefit from the conversation. Uh, can you share with us uh, an example, a case in your, in your experience that, um, that because of that, <coughs> Because of that, uh, the composition of the output uh, come, come, comes comes well. So there was time when it was an SPD show. Uh, the mo mobile developers were having a lot of uh, issues with how they deploy code, how they build code. Right? Um, so they, it turns out there were a lot of different phases in uh, the iOS and Android uh, code development, and the CI/CD and the branching strategy. I think essentially it was the budget strategy and how we go about creating different types of builds for um, local development, for like uh, for testing by, by the UAT and all sorts of stuff. So there, there was a time where all the different engineers in the team were like, kind of like in conflict. One had this one person is opinion, the other has a other opinion. Um, so what I did was I decided to talk to them individually, like find out what their concerns are. You know, I, I spoke to one guy, uh, what you think is, uh, what, what are your concerns, what are your primary concerns? You want to do this properly, or you want to go out of the, if you do it this way, what would be the issues that you foresee? You know, so I kind of like gave up a proposal, kind of spoke to them, hey, do you think this will work? Or did you give me the opinion? Great, done to one person. I went and talked to another person and kind of find out, okay, what do you think of your issues that you face? And you talk, uh, here's the proposal, what do you think is the uh, pros and cons and all that stuff. So, in doing this, I was able to like figure out what all their what their concerns are rather than being in the room and everyone shouting at each other. I spoke to them one at a time, figure out what they, what their concerns are, I kind of synergize all their concerns into a strategy of how we should do like we basically figure out how to do our branching strategy, how what, what tools we should use to kind of like do the proper builds at each particular uh, part of the of the, of the each, each stage of the build. And, um, and how we should deliver code to the, the hands of our users. And then the day, we our, I guess everyone in the team was really want to do the best. And it's really about figuring out what the concerns are, and figuring out how to come to a compromise and, and everything. Um, yeah, so it's about listening. I guess if I had not been willing to listen, I probably wouldn't have been able to do all that. And if they had not been the Conversely, if the guys I was talking to was open to the ideas I was proposing to them, I wouldn't have been able to achieve the things that we do. So during those times, a lot of the challenges as you try to try to uh, engage with each of them. Um, trying not to push my opinion. Mm -hmm. In a way, I was trying. Because even though I have a document of like a proposed approach, uh, but I was still telling them, "Hey, this is still a work in progress." Uh, tell me what you think, right? I mean, I was I was forcing myself to not talk and not impose my 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 ideas too much on the other person. But it's more like to tease out what the person is, is thinking and in, in, in their minds um, and figure out how do we synergize this. Okay, you have this opinion. This is what we have. What's the mid, 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 what's the main point we can reach right, that we have, that everyone will be happy with? Um. What, uh, how do you relate yourself as a software craftsman? Um, so one of the happiest moments in my life was when I, uh, when I joined 
new innovation uh, in 2014, uh, 2013, sorry. So at the time, uh, because so after the startup, uh, Pimental Labs was basically was sold, uh, Labs Singapore was sold to, to a company called uh, Digital Garage, and they basically formed a new practice, uh, and their practice called New Innovation. So when I joined, uh, uh, when, when I was, I, I interviewed there, and then the guy um, basically hired, started hiring me, I was like, wow, I, the company that I used to, uh, so the company where I we got all these awesome practices from is once to hire me and me about their consultants. I think it's a pretty cool thing. When doing so, I also felt very a little bit like um, imposter syndrome going into their team and wow, these are surrounded by these awesome engineers and you know, and I don't even have the word senior in my in my position. Where it's like wow, in my previous job I was a senior software engineer. Here I'm just a software engineer. So it's kind of like. In a way, it felt like an emotion, but it also felt that wow, I'm really surrounded by really awesome people, and they are they really willing to teach you things. And then for that, I was able to, I was able to go back to that that beginning and really learn from scratch again. And what really turned on the light bulb in my head about the software craftsmanship is when my my mentor sat me down. Hey, you ever heard about this thing called um, solid, right? Uh, I was like, wow, what is Solid? Well, Solid is like the design principle, you know, sing, uh, single responsibility principle, and a few other things inside there. But that opened my mind, wow, me, there is, there are actually established uh, conventions and names for like way or how we write code. That blew my mind. I was like, wow, okay, I want to learn more about this thing. And from doing that, I, re I just realized that, oh, wow, actually there are uh, established norms about how you should write code. and. Um, how you design a code and how you should um, do write code in a way that is understand, understandable by other people. Like you write code in a particular pattern, other developers will look at your software and say, oh yeah, this is this particular pattern, I know where to go and find things. Right? So um, that helps, that really helps in, 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 at least for me to organize my code better. And, and it, made me, it made it a lot easier for me to make changes uh, in my code in the future when I need to like, oh, oh, make some change. I knew where to go, and even other developers look at my code, we know, oh, okay, he was using this pattern when we implementing this feature. They knew where to exactly go to kind of fix things and make changes too. Um, that, that, and that productivity gain from doing that, I think it's pretty awesome. Yeah, so that for me was kind of like the turning point when he sat me down and told me, have you heard about this thing or saw it? So, yes. So, uh, anyone heard about Solid before? No? So it's a five five uh, software design principles. Um, the his, some history of it is that when oh God, is it is it created by uh, Herbal? Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, so Herbal Sleep at home. We have one sensor here. <laughs> so uh, what happened is that uh, it wasn't it wasn't this acronym until Michael Fellas found that actually if you rearrange it. It is slim solid. So S is single responsibility principle. O is open close principle. Uh, L is this cost substitution principle. I is interface segregation principle. And D is dependency and inversion. And inversion. Yes, <coughs> principles. Uh, this principles guide us to how to transform our code so that um, creates less mess. So it's easy, easy to change. Um, talking about mentors, who would you consider uh, mentors in your life? Wow. Um, so the guy who sat me down and told me about this thing called uh, Solid. His name is called his name is Gabe. Gabe Hornbit. Um, he works. He was he was basically a senior consultant at uh, at New Innovation at the time. But currently he is a tech evangelist at AWS. In, in his base in Singapore. So he's, he's, he's a really gentle fellow, and he would like, um, he's really good at mentoring you. you know? And at times where we would go on long walks just to discuss about um, things about life, about code, and about everything else. So yeah, I would think he's a really good mentor to me. Well, what are the few things that you learned from him? So I saw this one. <laughs> 
I think the whole 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 approach to software, right? As in, I, I remember I was pairing with him, and uh, so the way that we do pair programming in, in Neo is that we have like um, we we'll sit across from each other. So our tables is set in the way that iMac is here, monitor is here. So his the iMac is facing him, and the monitor is facing uh, me. So we're kind of like in a Z shape kind of kind of thing. So I can see him uh, across from the table. And I'll be coding, and he'll be doing his coding. And there was a time when we were, because uh, I was, we were coding, we were building a Rails app, and we were using Vim to build the, the Rails app. And we were using Vim, and we were using this uh, multiplexer called Tmux. You are familiar with that. So we have Tmux and Vim, and we have from our Vim window, we could like, trigger an aspect test that fires off of another, another window in Tmux, which is really cool. But actually, or rather, let's backtrack that. We couldn't get it to work. For some reason, we checked out the code, we tried to do this, we were like, trying to use a shortcut to trigger the test, it just wasn't working. I was like, for me, for me, as a, as a, for me I would have kind of given up after five times, just could have done the, the hard and harder way, which is to switch the other window and run and go press up on the keyboard, the R set command and run the command. I would have done that easily, I would, like, I would, I would just do that manual work, right? For him, he just couldn't let it go. And he was like, there has to be a way to do this. As in, let's time box this, let's figure out how to get this, how to fix this thing in the next 10 minutes. So he went in, figured out, look at the uh, VIM configuration, I was just staring at him doing all this, all this thing, and going in, this, the, 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 oh, okay, there was a thing when he started, the, 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 got it, came out, hey, it works now. He was, he was in from, so when he, when we first started coding uh, pairing, he basically got, was quite frustrated because that thing wouldn't work. He was like, ah. but once he got it to work, it was like, wow, this awesome, it works now. And our productivity was so much higher. Just that response time, because one thing we revalue in, in running software is rapid feedback. That constant feedback about your code, is it working, is it working, is it working, is it working, is it working? And to be able to write code and have just a shortcut key that triggers a test, that, that response time and feedback loop is so fast. And from that point onwards, I knew that, wow, getting your development suite set up properly was so important. And, and, and your personal productivity as a, as a software engineer, that is, because you use the IDE your whole day, right? This is your weapon of choice, your tool, and your proficiency in the tool. From that point, I really learned that proficiency in your tool is very, very important. Because that is your, your route to happiness, right? Writing code in the way that Ah, it works, it just works, it just works. I got test, test is feeling great. Let's write, let's write, let's write, let's write the code again. You know, kind of like that rapid feedback is so important. And having the tool, your tool set up in a way, the tooling set up in a way that gives you that rapid response and rapid feedback. I mean, that's one of the things I learned about it, which I would have thought was very important. And to this very day, whenever I go to a new machine, I'll try and make sure all the configuration is set up, set up in a way that, that works for me. Uh, Ruby mine will change the key the, the, to the key mapping which works for me. I will just change the environment that suits my uh, working style, right? Because at the end of the day, as a software engineer, as a software person, mm -hmm. writing to and building, that is how you express um, your creativity and how you express, how you, how you deliver value to customers. And the, with the, and the time, the productivity gains you get from having an environment set up in a way that will deliver code faster, deliver code effectively, I think it's very important. Uh, talking about semantic and also looking on the other sides, how do you help others to grow? So I ran this group called Junior Dev Singapore. So I started, uh, I started about two years ago, about two years ago. And it came from, uh, the idea came from, uh, actually from, from Australia. There was this other group that started this, which is called Junior Dev Taiwan. So I kind of liked it. I uh, saw a friend of mine posted about it on Twitter. And I kind of like the idea and what I'm bringing to Singapore. So in Junior Dev uh, SG, we have meetups that, that, that like this, which are attended by junior developers. And we basically, it's kind of like a place where they, can, uh, we, they feel safe to learn from each other. It's a safe environment where you can share about anything that you don't have to worry about people judging you and say, ah, oh, that's so new, right? But actually, everyone there is learning, which is great. And everyone everyone is great. It's a safe environment for you to learn from each other. Uh, that's always one thing I did. Uh, and there's also a developer's gym that we work, we do every two weeks. 
when you come together with devices, write, write code together, learn about coding dojo. We do things at coding dojo. Uh, we also do uh, coding workshops so people can learn about new frameworks like new JS and a few other things. Um, we also run a mentoring program. So we have a group, uh, group mentoring program where basically we bring together senior developers who can basically talk and mentor junior developers on things like um, life skills and uh, how to, uh, basic soft skills about well, because a lot of the people that we get in the management program are like freshmen software developers like their first year in, uh, in, in, in software engineering and all that stuff for them it's like a totally new thing especially more so for people who are like mid-career switches we have a couple of mid-career switches who like was working in just one industry and now they're working in the software development industry so tech industry and tech companies is so different from a banking industry, a banking company right so yeah, so some of them are just not prepared for that. And I guess having a group like this would basically help them understand about what we could, what to look out for, and how to prepare themselves for those kind of things. So as you were sharing this, uh, it, I, I imagine like uh, it was something like when no experience, never experience with game, hmm. expand out to the larger group of people in Singapore. Yeah, yes. It, Cool. Now, um, what is what is the uh, what is the uh, some moments of the what what is some moments that is kick in your career? Kick as it like uh, you know, is it highlights? It, it can be some uh, events that happen or some behavior that happen that is a kick. I remember when I was at New Innovation, we had a project for a handset maker that shall not be named. And, <laughs> and basically, we built some software for them. And I was responsible for the back end uh, aspect of it. Right? So, it was working on the back end code, uh, it was REST API. They had already at one point um, reset their user database because they needed to roll out a new uh, version of the app and for some other reason the app didn't support a new uh, uh, old users so they had to reset the database. Um, so we, and that was less than six months ago and here we are with a, a really new version of the app that could potentially result in another reset because we introduced really new features into the app that, could, uh, that basically didn't um, support new, uh, could it pos potentially could it support new older users. Um, so I, I decided very early on that we should try a pincer approach where we will receive, uh, build, the, uh, build the app, but also want to make it such that the older users can still continue using the older version of the app. So basically, we have two. Uh, so the old version of the app is running Sinatra, and when a new version I'm building it runs on uh, Ruby on Rails. And they basically share the same MySQL database instance. And basically, I decided that this pizza approach would be best in the best interest of the users. But in doing so, it also resulted in a longer development time period uh, because we need to make sure we test the thing properly, we make sure that the uh, right code, we model all the models that were meant to go out there, uh, we we'll, uh, do performance testing on the, on the new instance, uh, to make sure that it works properly. Because with the new uh, app that we're rolling out, it will it will very different use use case and, and basically um, we uh, at least in the first time we ran the performance test, um, we realized that a lot of the, the tables were going through a full table scan because we had a, and, and this thing I wouldn't have we wouldn't have known if we didn't do this uh, thing right? because the usage behavior on, on the, in the new app is so different from the old app and basically new new indexes new indexes needed to be added to the database. So this whole process of building out this Ruby and uh, uh, Ruby app for them took a bit longer than expected and there were times where I had to sit in front of the um, client kind of like tell them, try to explain to them why we need to do this to take a bit longer and there were times that I, had, I went into a bit of a self-doubt and said, am I doing this wrong? Was this the best decision? Was this... They didn't tell me to do this. I decided I want to do, I want to do this. Right? I didn't do this. I did this without consulting the client but I knew it was in the best interest of, of the users, right? But I'm, and here I have to defend my decision and the longer development time period. And, and to, to my uh, boss's credit, he basically defended uh, my, uh, my decision. 
Um, so there are always these uh, try to calm the client down, so in the head, we will be able to deliver on time. Uh, but it, meant, it also meant I work, work a few, one weekend uh, and over time just to make sure that the performance test was on top of power and all that stuff. Um, I went through a bit of a depression at the time because I was really going through that self-doubt, am I doing this correctly? Um, but once we delivered it and we deployed it and uh, people were still able to use the old app and the new app at the same time and, it, and so we started seeing the uh, users jumping on the new system, on the new, on the new app. Um, for me, that was like, wow, it's working. And my boss came to me, good job. And the client was very happy with the approach because they didn't have to reset the database. And um, last I heard, uh, the app actually, before it was sold down, it was actually one of the most profitable app for that particular handset maker. So, anyway, so that's one of the side stories. But yeah, it was a, for me, it was a bit of a, it was a low, but it was also very high because is this, this big validation of the of of that approach that you should build software that's well tested, you should build software that it, it, it serves the purpose of the user, of people who are using the app. At the same time, you want to build it in a way that it's extendable, easy to use, and people are able to developers, other developers are able to continue working on it. Right? So even after I finished building the app, the new team that took over, because as a consultancy we roll off project. And then it takes over. So the new, new team took over, they were, continue, they were able to continue building on, on the platform that I built. So I'm happy. Yes. And, and the next uh, I'm going to ask is I know you shared it, the, the little part as well. Um, what would be an experience that is the, the lowest moments in our development experience? So, um, so before I, I, I joined, so I, as I say, I left the industry for, for about a year, a uh, year plus, working with, for a uh, um, US military, con military contractor that had a presence in Singapore and doing some, I was basically a project, project manager for some of their products. Uh, I got to travel a little bit and that was quite fun. Um, but after that, um, Company didn't do so well, and I had to go back to um, doing something that, that I could do. And the first thing that uh, kind of my business partner at the time kind of approached me and said, We should do stuff for like spring grants, like e commerce websites and stuff for spring grants. And some, for some reason, whatever I do, the the client just wasn't happy. <laughs> so I do this, it took me longer than expected. They were just not happy. And there was really another thing, they were still not happy. Um, I got to the point where I was quite doubtful in myself. That this, is, this is really. I, I think, on hindsight, probably if I had a project manager, we knew how to like, discuss this properly with the client and figure out the requirements, it would be a lot easier. But, I have one client that actually came to me with like uh, dozens of Excel sheets. He basically, he basically did all his mockups in Excel. Right, like the, the, the different form fields and shit. And I was supposed to implement those, right? So, <laughs> so I basically, yeah, okay, uh, what, how hard can this be? Famous last words. <laughs> so, and I kept missing things, right? Because he like, Oh yeah, we we saw this particular piece. What piece? Uh, open it. Oh, huh? <laughs> okay, if that's the thing. Okay, fine. The implementer. Then, oh, this is great. Wait, where is this part? What do you this part? Oh, you click this. You go to this other sheet. This other page is missing. This pop up. Uh, how would I know? So, yeah, it was months and months of of that, right? Which which um wasn't fun. It really wasn't fun. It got to the point where um, I really want to get out of the company at the time, and but then because of this obligation, I need to continue working because it was already paid for. I continue working on the project, and uh, oh, it's fine. I think it's good. So um, 
So because of that, I have to continue, I have to continue working on the project, and there were times that I stay over at the client's place just to get that work done. So um, that was a low period of my life. Yeah. I noticed that the zero was. How how do you deal with that? Those periods. Expect this follow-up question. <laughs> <laughs> in that particular situation, I, I got out of the company, and then um, because it was just so toxic, and, and, and it felt it wasn't an environment where I could excel or I could, I could grow in. So I really left the company. To um, it's painful. It's painful to kind of like, um, see something you built. And then realize that it's really not something I want to do. Uh, rather than being a company with this something I want to do, and then um, having to leave that behind, um, it wasn't easy. Yeah. But on the flip side, once uh, I left the company, I uh, there were other opportunities that came that came up, and um, I joined a startup at the time. Um, even though I I think previously that startup I previously built the other beta version, alpha version of the API. I taught that company. So once I left the company and the CEO kind of approached me, hey, would you like to help um, continue doing this stuff? Uh, yeah, sure, yeah. why not? Seems like fun. Yeah, and then and eventually the company got funded and they were, they, at the rest of my life working in that startup, um, the, the people there were really, uh, as I said, they were really strong engineers. We were going through the to labs that taught us all these awesome uh, best practices. We kind of doing good work. And we, I, the most memorable time uh, working at a company was we got to go to, to Silicon Valley, San Francisco, uh, twice. So, so that we could like, pitch our app there and, and all that stuff. Um, yeah, I mean, basically because we were a former client of Crypto Labs, we could like, work out of Crypto Labs office in, in, in uh, San Francisco. It's kind of cool, so yeah, it's kind of nice. Do you, do, you go, do you grow stronger out of that experience? Yes, you, I think um, going through all that um, shitty software development, you realize that how important, um, for example, writing tests is, um, how important having uh, a good understanding of what the client wants is also important. Um, and sometimes you also realize that maybe I'm not the best as a doctor client. <laughs> so let's get someone who is better than this doctor client. Um, yeah, but again, it's a skill I, I, I do need to get back into, like talking to people, talking to uh, stakeholders. I think it's an important skill for me as a family to be talking to, uh, be able to uh, communicate um, the rules and technical, technical considerations to, uh, to the stakeholders. Product owners and so on and so forth. So, um, yeah. Um, I wonder if there are any questions for Michael. Yeah. No, yeah. Hello, Michael. So, um, with all your experience of software development and also to mentor junior developers, what do you consider as the most important traits for a software developer to have? either to develop or to recognize in a software developer? <laughs> it's a very hard, very hard question. <laughs> okay, I guess it, it really depends like what kind of software developer you want to be. Um, uh, most important aspect. And I think I thought about being open. Uh, so that's really, a, I think to this day, I think it's still a very important aspect to for any software developer to have that open minded to be open minded to have different approaches of doing software. Um, and also, and so basically, be open to opinions and be open to other people telling you about your software approach and also being open to criticisms. Um, but at the same time, being sure about where you're coming from. And try and try to try to identify like is that just an opinion or is this really a fact, right? So the ability to decipher those two, like like 
taps as a spaces is a matter of opinion. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a. Yeah, it's not a fact that using taps is more efficient than using spaces. It's not. It's not. So is it? So being able really to recognize this too, sometimes it's a bit hard. Like, you know, you're really this way, and someone gave you a code review saying, yeah, but is that an opinion or is it really more of a. His, does it mean that what he's saying is moving my code more efficient or proficient or more effective? No, maybe not, because it's more of an opinion, right? Um, what you're optimizing for. So, yeah. How about this question? For someone new to the concept of testing, uh, can you recommend a good way to start learning this? Are there any books or videos or tutorials that you recommend? If you're doing Ruby, I would recommend watching all the videos from Sandy Mets. Let me hear what you Okay. Actually, if you're not even if you're not doing Ruby, I think it's a good. Uh, they have a whole bunch of videos that Shinji have uh, talked, given talks at in the past at RailsCon and whatnot. She has this particular video which is called Magic Tricks of Testing. Yeah, 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 Magic Tricks of
uh, when we, the requirements come down and to us and we kind of get, have an open discussion and negotiation with our product owners about what we could do, what we could not do, whether this scope is realistic, this realistic scope is, uh, is realistic, it's achievable, and we can have a discussion about what we can modulate right, in terms of the scope. Whereas with, with a, as a vendor, you, have, you end up having to deliver anyway because you, you're, you're being paid to deliver those things and you have to deliver on time. As you got the key, we have worked this internally, there's some leeway to kind of like, okay, we, we do have a fair bit of production issues to deal with, could we maybe uh, move that particular story to the next iteration while we deal with these bugs right now? That's because I'm speaking as an insider, as a person who is working in the company as part on the side of the government, I was able to give really opinion that I, uh, I was able to give opinions that were considered and listened to and accepted. Right. So we could I I guess in that sense, um, being inside makes it a bit easier for them to trust us and to have to see and because we have delivered results in the past, it's easier to open to trust us again. Right. Um, as for the inefficiencies, um, within the confines of the project of the product that we're building, uh, we try our best to be as efficient as we can, but there are constraints. The constraints are sometimes there to protect us because security, right? Because of security, because of whatever else there is. And the constraints were designed by people who I hope and hope to believe uh, have the best intentions in mind, and we trust them for that. Um, sometimes we argue a fair bit about constraints and why is it this way, this, this constraint is so inefficient. Is creating a lot more problems for us. But at the same time, the constraints also builds a parameter we can build, we can, a parameter in which you can, can operate with it. And within this, within this parameter, you have a lot of freedom of choice in terms of software that we use, in terms of, uh, in terms of tools that we use, and even the practices that we use. Like we use Agile, we use, we use Scrum, uh, we, we, we encourage TDD, we have CI and CD going running, uh, running in the security system. All the best practices you can think about in terms of DevOps, software development, we have. Um, also, thanks in part to Talkworks, we brought this, uh, we brought, we were basically the first vendor and brought these practices to the, to, the, to the ministry. And in a way, because they have proven, uh, they have proven track record, as in they built something that was successful and accepted by people, it was easier for the ministry, MYM, to, and even the to trust us you know, to continue doing the work that we um, I think a lot of it is about trust and being in good, having doing things in good faith, and I think in many ways we we hope to continue doing that because at the end of the day I think if we don't I mean at the end of the day GovTech is here to ensure that we build the best e services that our government can can can, can have right uh, and that's our mission we if we if, if we are not here and if we we don't get enough people who are serious about building good software in government, there's no way we can do this, continue doing this, right? So it's important for us to continue recruiting people of the highest caliber who knew how, how to write good software and at the same time knows how to communicate to the stakeholders. And that's what we want to do, right? Continue building good and high quality uh, e-services for, for our citizens as well as anyone who uses, uh, who translate to the government. All right, that's a great uh, wrap up. Uh, thank you, Michael Shane again. Thank you. Cool.